Good evening, everybody. Welcome, welcome to our uh, eighth episode here of the Presidio Perspective. My name is Dustin Tembrook. I'm the president of Presidio Capital Management. So glad you guys are joining us once again. Can't believe it's eight episodes now um, that we've been doing this. And uh, we're so glad that you could join us. And I know we still have attendees signing on, but we'll go ahead and get started here. I'm joined today by uh, our new, my new colleague and uh, member of Presidio Capital Management Team, Luke Jacobson. Um, really glad to have Luke here. Um, Luke, make sure to unmute yourself there too. Yeah, awesome. There we go. Yeah, cool, Luke. So I know you know we talked so much over those last couple months about the markets and everything's going on, and you know a lot of behind the scenes in these presentations. So it's so so good to actually have you joining me today. So really glad that that you're part of Presidio and here, man. Great, thank you. Appreciate it. Yeah, absolutely. So, uh, so Luke's a CFA, new member of Presidio, investment advisor, wealth advisor with the team. So I'll get into uh, our agenda. I'm going to share my screen and we'll have a nice little presentation for you today. So good. Hopefully that you can see that. So uh, yes. Wow. That is just some nice artistic work there by Cheyenne Tabrizi. Um, that was beautiful, man. Good job. So yes, our disclaimer, first of all, of course, as you know, all investing uh, involves risk, in the, including the loss of principal. So no strategy or product can assure success or protect against loss. Past performance is no guarantee of future results. Also, of course, we're not giving anybody specific tax, legal, or investment advice in these episodes uh, on this webcast. So make sure you consult your tax, legal, and financial professionals before making any, any decisions. So tonight's discussion will be centered around a lot of what we've been talking about. Of course, we're going to do an update on COVID-19 um, you know, over the last week, what we're looking at. Governor Newsom, so the governor of California has released his four stage plan to reopen uh, California. So we'll take a look at those four stages, what those involve uh, and where we might be in, in that phase and what we can expect. We'll also talk about a lot of the uncertainty around the market as it relates to some of the experts that have come out. You know, we've had uh, companies reporting their um, the results of the first quarter and kind of getting some of the top CEOs out there of their views of what's going on and the uncertainty that they're facing and running their businesses. And of course, kind of just share our perspective of what's going on out there and what, and what we're keenly um, in tune with. So, so first a little update on COVID-19. So um, yeah, the news is still really dire and depressing. You know, we still have a lot of deaths every day, a lot of new cases every day. And so we've seen a flattening of the curve, which is good, but it's still at a really drastic rate as far as, you know, fatalities that we're experiencing globally and in, in, in the US. So, you know, when we're looking at the amount of confirmed cases, you know, so we know that there is varying uh, debates about how many actual cases there are um, and it's, it's the consensus is that there's a lot more cases of, of this disease than are being reported because people are either asymptomatic or just don't have as severe of a flu. So we understand that. But what we track are confirmed cases. And so uh, when it looks at the mortality rate, we just look at what is the mortality rate of this disease as far as confirmed cases that we get. So today we have over 3.8 million confirmed cases uh, worldwide. Um, about one, one and a half million of those have reached an end, are no longer active cases. So we see that 1,287,000 of them had recovered and 263,000 of those um, no longer active cases did result in death. So we, we've lost a lot of lives due to this uh, disease so far. If you look at the, the fatality rate of those diseases that have closed thus far, that's 17%. So you know, that's just what the mathematics are of, of that. Um, so of the closed cases, you know, 17%. If the remaining active cases globally, if every single one of them, including those in ICU and hospitalization, severe cases, everything, if everybody was to recover that still has an active case, we would find that that mortality rate is, a, is approximately 7%. Okay, so approximately 7% 
of reported cases are resulting in death. Uh, and so, so that's something that, you know, I think we all need to be aware of um, when, we, when we're looking at how many new active cases are being reported. To me, when I, I, it, it makes me really sad because I watch it every day and I'm looking forward to the day where I don't have to do that. But, you know, still, uh, and we'll talk about the U.S. here in a second, but, you know, when you're looking at 25,000, 30,000 new cases a day and you just know what those numbers are, um, it, it's, it's pretty sad. So, um, we have seen some, some bright spots, you know, in, in different areas of the world uh, that have seem, seemed to come to the other side of this. So Southeastern Australia is one of those regions where they had nearly a week with no new active cases and have really begun to fully open up um, their economy and, and their way of life. So we're starting to see some of that bright spots. I know Luke's going to comment about some of that going on globally as well. Uh, United States, we have over uh, one and a quarter million cases here in the U.S., so a pretty big percentage of that world, world uh, share, and 279,000 of those are no longer active. We're, we're luckily 205,000 had recovered, but we have in the U.S. 74,000 um, uh, confirmed fatalities so far due to this, due to this crisis, just in the U.S. So our fatality rate in closed cases is, is 26% of those cases that were closed. And again, if all of the active cases that we have right now were to all miraculously recover, including those in critical condition, our number would be around 6%. So, you know, again, we're, we're seeing uh, um, it's too much. We have to do a lot better at, you know, containing this disease. And obviously there's lots of worries, you know, debating about how this uh, reopening of economies and phases and way of life is going to go. Um, Cause certainly if we're adding 25, 30,000 new cases a day, and we're thinking that 6% of those are going to result in death, that's, that's a staggering number that, that we have to face. Um, the Trump administration has projected that the number of deaths will increase to about 3,000 per day, so about 50% higher than what we're seeing right now uh, in early June. I think yesterday was about 2,500, if I'm not mistaken. So, you know, still, um, it's very depressing to, to see this continuing, and it's, it's odd to talk about reopening the economy and, um, you know, going back to some way of life and and I, I feel that way constantly, you know, we're, we're bored, we're, we're stressed, we're, we're, you know, I, I feel like I'm in a jail cell. I, I mean, I, you know, I'm, um, it's tough, you know, and, and we are very much looking forward to getting to the other side. And, you know, I complain a lot about having to cancel my vacations for the year and, you know, all these little things. And, you know, when you kind of look at the big, big uh, picture, you know, there's a lot to be grateful for and, a, and a, a lot to still focus on from a, from a health perspective for people in this country. Unemployment, um, you know, the numbers are coming in and, you know, over, over 30 million people have lost their jobs in the last six weeks. And so we reported that last week that now every single job that has been created since the financial crisis and the Great Recession uh, in 2008, 2009, every single one of those jobs has been lost once again. Uh, the Fed is estimating now that for 2020, we're going to have over a 30% unemployment rate, which is higher than we've seen in the peak of the Great Depression. You know, on the peak of the Great Recession, it was 10%. Um, so, you know, again, this is really uncharted territory and un unprecedented numbers that we haven't really dealt with before. Meanwhile, the stock market still continues to go up, you know, over the last month as these numbers have come in. We'll talk to you a little bit of why that is. Uh, for those of you who are interested and are, are tracking, um, you know, the numbers of this disease and kind of looking at the metrics, you might be aware that John Hopkins has had, you know, a, a data dashboard uh, kind of showing globally in, some po in, 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 in specific regions like countries, and they've gone a little bit further now. And so now there's dashboards in wherever you are. So if you're in Orange County, you can go into the dashboard here uh, and a quick Google search will pop this up and we have the you know URL down there, but you can easily Google it. And it's gonna kind of, it updates every single day telling you about what's going on. And in San Diego County and Orange County are two virtually identical 
regions when you look at the demographics and, and population and, and so forth. So very similar what's happening um, between these two regions as far as the total amount of confirmed cases. So from San Diego and, and Orange County. Um, you know, what we have seen, and this is San Diego, but you can see the same in, in Orange County, is if we track the number of new cases going from you know, the beginning of March through the beginning of May, you, know, you can see that we had this curve where things were spiking up. And what we were hoping in mid-April is that this is kind of when we were, we were hoping that cases would level off. And we've certainly seen a surge where you can just look at this graph and see the amount of new cases that have been reported recently are, are starting to, to steepen. So again, something that's somewhat concerning as we're talking about reopening the economy and going back out there. Um, and, and it's really nice to, to be able to get outside of your, your, your doors every once in a while um, and hopefully are taking the the proper precautions and so forth, but it's odd, you know, if those of you who have ventured out and you're wearing masks and doing what you can, but, um, but so something to, to watch. So now our cases in San Diego County are over 4,000, you know, which is roughly doubled in the last, you know, two to three weeks, you know, we've seen a, seen a doubling in cases. So, so something that will continue to kind of report on these, um, on these episodes for you. So when it comes to uh, the, the to slowly reopen the economy, Newsom has put out a four stage plan um, of how California is looking to reopen its economy. So it starts with stage one, safety and preparedness, which you know we I guess we are through going into stage two, which are called low risk workplaces, high risk workplaces, and then end of the stay at home order in stage four. Um, and so stage one is, you know, making sure that the test, the, the state had the proper ability to really ramp up testing and tracing and uh, personal protective equipment like masks and gloves and those things and uh, being able to have the hospital capacity that, you know, they could handle another surge uh, and prioritize the safety for workers and customers in, in these essential workspaces. So, you know, kind of initially, you know, um, Luke, you were tuned into this kind of live when he was going over this, right? And I mean, what was the tone as far as, you know, the timing of these different stages and what we were going to see? Well, the original uh, statement from Gavin was um, we would see stage two within weeks, not days. And this was after 45 minutes of a speech. And then we would see stage three at months, not weeks. So it's a pretty substantial time frame. There's been a, a slight change of pace in the last few days with some pushback from, I guess, our citizens. But um, there's reason to believe that we won't see these stages for, for a while, or at least see, maybe see these stages in baby steps even. Yeah, so, so stage two is, I guess, um, where we start to see some, some change in our life and day to day where we're gonna gradually open some low risk businesses and workplace. <laughs> You know, and, and they're just going to see about, again, kind of Luke referred to the citizens, like, are we going to be able to really maintain social distancing? So we've seen that in, in Orange County in LA, where other counties have tried to reopen beaches and then had to close them again because people weren't maintaining social distances, distancing. So, you know, what will retail businesses look like? reopen manufacturing businesses. So a lot of the, what uh, I think Newsom was talking about is making sure to kind of institute a, a system for curbside pickup for retail businesses, right? And, and um, so that you'd be able to, you know, I guess, order your stuff in advance and, and, uh, and, and open up some part of the retail economy. And so that office workers may also return uh, to those where telework is not possible and increase ac access to public spaces. I think that this phase, you know, is going to take a, a, a bit of trial and error to really figure out how this is gonna come together. And, you know, I think it's, you know, logical and thought out of, you know, of, you know a lot of what we're facing when, when this happens. But even us as, you know, uh, in Presidio, thinking about, you know, as we reopen the economy, 
Um, and, you know, as we, we report back to the office, you know, we'll likely be doing that in, in stages and in shifts, not to make sure that not everybody within the organization is all in one place at one time. Um, and I think that's going to be really important for businesses to consider and how they're going to adapt their workforce um, as, we, as we come back to the offices or retail spaces. Because if you have an outbreak within your organization and everybody's hit, you know, that could be uh, pretty risky to small and mid-sized businesses. So, so this is, I, Luke, would you say we're in stage two or we're approaching stage two? Well, the theory is we're approaching it uh, this Friday, but it sounds like we're approaching it in a stepwise fashion. So it's like we're approaching stage 2.1. Right. Right. And it, yeah, right. And so I think that there's, you know, again, we're going to see, you know, kind of how this goes and, and tiptoe into the water here and, and kind of see if, if we have to go back or, or whatnot. Stage three is kind of when you, you start to see life kind of reemerge as it was. And again, this is what Newsom was saying. This is months and months away. Right. But this is when, OK, we can have, you know, gatherings of a certain size. Um, there's there's going to be some limitations, but, you know, salons and gyms might be able to reopen. Um, you know, you can see sports without live audiences. Right. Movie theaters, you know, religious services can return to in-person uh, setting. So this is a lot more of our social way of life. And again, this is still quite a long ways out. And I think that the timeline, obviously, for any of these stages is going to depend on the stage that precedes it. So we're, we're going to watch over these next weeks, you know, what happens as, as stage two goes into place and how successful it is and what happens with the numbers of, of new diseases to see how quickly we can get to stage three. But I think all of us selfishly is from, you know, just a quality of life standpoint, you know, we can see that, you know, we, we um, can, can live some version of what we used to live prior to COVID, you know, in this kind of stage that, that the governor has laid out. And uh, stage four is, is when we get to go to the ball games again, we get to go to concert conventions. And, um, you know, this is a, this is a big unknown of how long it's going to be. Um, and, and again, with all of these stages, and Luke, I know you were commenting about this to me, I think last week when we were talking about this, is there's one thing to have the plan, right, where, where government says, you know, hey, here's what you can do. But it's another thing to, for the citizens to say, here's what I'm going to do, right? Absolutely. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. It's, it's about turning the light switch on and turning it turning it off, turning it back on, and how different that's likely going to feel. Right, and I think that's very interesting, is that, um, you know, that comment about the light switch, where, you know, we're here with this really bad economic scenario, uh, where the government has had the power to turn the light switch off, and issue stay-at-home orders, and, you know, and, and basically just shut the economy down, as a needed precaution for the safety of its citizens. Um, but I think, Luke, what you're kind of mentioning is it lacks the capacity to turn the switch back on. What do you mean right. by that? Well, effectively, I didn't have an option whether I was going to, to go to restaurants or movie theaters or vacation, get on the airplane. The government, you know, issued an order and, and I abide by that order. But as, as we move forward into stage two, stage three, and potentially stage four, um, I get a choice of whether I want to take risk. It's actually my decision. The government um, gives me the option, but I can decide if I want to go to a restaurant or what restaurant I want to or, or how I start to allocate my family's risk across activities for a week. And that's likely going to have a... Um, <clears throat> here we go. Can you hear me now? Maybe that'll help. I can get closer if that helps. I see somebody uh, texting in here. Um, and I'll just try to talk a little bit louder. How about that? There you go. Um, we get my train of thought back. We get a choice of whether we want to, to take risk, and that's going to have a big impact on how the economy snaps back. Yeah, yeah absolutely. And that, that's more of that unknown un or the known unknown that we have to deal with. Um, so, Luke, do you want to kind of take us through some of this economic update? There's sure. a lot of uncertainty that is shared seemingly throughout the business world, and kind of give us your comments through that. Great. So uh, once again, I'm uh, Luke Jacobson, and um, I guess we can see me here, right, Dustin? 
Yep. Yeah, I mean, okay, great. Um, so uh, uncertainty everywhere. Um, you know, when I talk about this, I want to provide perspective. I've had um, 10, 15 years of institutional management where I worked on security selection, building portfolios, and really managing risk and understanding how to allocate risk. Um, and so when I think about risk, um, an interesting thing to, to think about um, in a simplistic term is that there's such a thing as an unknown unknown that's a risk in the market, and there's such a thing as a known unknown. Let's kind of let's work with that framework in today's world. Um, a, a known unknown would be election this November. I know we're having an election. There's a, there's a risk of just a change in the guard of the United States, and I don't know what the outcome is. So I know there's a risk. I don't know what that risk ha is potentially. Um, let's contrast that with an unknown unknown or a trapdoor event. Um, coronavirus shows up in the United States. It's entirely unknown that it was going to happen, and it's very much unknown to the public and investors, and it creates substantial um, risk and anxiety and volatility in the markets. Um, and that volatility in the markets can be, um, can be stated in the volatility index, which in February of this year was around 80. So let's, let's think about an unknown unknown. And, and as I was talking about this, I just thought to myself, all the things I know now that I didn't know 45, 60 days ago, um, I didn't know what shelter in place was. Um, I didn't know that there was lots of different coronaviruses um, at all. Um, I did not know uh, that ventilators in a hospital were of really short supply. And I, I know all those now. And I didn't know that I needed to wash my hands for 20 seconds. Um, I get the happy birthday song pretty much all day long here from my from my young kids as uh, they sing the happy birthday song twice for 20 seconds. So really, really what that's done, what I've like, exemplified there is we've moved from an unknown, unknown status to more of a known status. And, and while our markets right now are not entirely known, they're a lot more known than they were 45 days ago. And that is also exemplified by the volatility index that is now closed today at 34. So we've moved from a, a hot peak, a recent peak of 80 back to 34. So we've moved more to a market of um, a more known um, unknown. And things that I better understand now, I understand um, how we, we understand how the virus spreads, um, or we have a better understanding of how it spreads and how we can help people around us. Uh, we know how to better support our communities. Um, through social distancing and what that means and what's required of us to actually do that. Um, we also have all the statistics that Dustin just went through about um, how, are you, you can hear me fine, right, Dustin? Okay, uh, I'm sorry for anything that can't, can't hear me. If you need to, we can, uh, we can schedule a call and we can walk through this one-on-one um, -on -one if you like. Um, so, um, and we have a lot of statistics. So that gives some comfort um, to market participants as we think about risk um, in the market. So as we think about uncertainty everywhere, moving to uh, the slide deck, this economic outlook, um, we're in Q1 reporting season where some of our market leaders, you wanna put the slides up so they can see this. Um, we have um, economic, economic outlook, and I'll just walk through a few of these. For example, Tim Cook, who's the head of Apple, um, just recently said it's hard to see out the windshield to know what the next 60 days look like. And he's saying this um, 30 days into a 90 day quarter. Usually by 30 days in the quarter, you have a decent idea of what the future, at least of what that quarter is going to look like. And I think it's important to say that that Apple was one of the canaries in the coal mine who released their information early that their uh, lead times on iPhones um, were going to be delayed. So it's very interesting that they had a very strong view that something was going to be a problem. Um, but, um, but now they're, they're not having visibility. If we turn the page um, to Dara um, at Uber, who just recently mentioned that COVID-19 and the uncertainty is called for every part of the world, it's impossible to predict with precision the pandemic's impact on financial results. So it's not just simply us um, financial planners or asset allocators that are looking at the market and having tremendous uncertainty um, businesses uh, the most successful businesses in the S&P or in the domestic markets are also having sub substantial t um, problems um, looking to the future. And really that just speaks vol volumes on the lack of visibility in the market. 
Um, and and I think that, that I think it's really important to just take a step back and instead of thinking about all the negative things that we can bring out of the market, um, we have a lack of vis visibility on the positives too. We don't know when there could be um, a uh, technology to help um, antiviral or to help people that are in need. Um, there's a lot of positive things that we don't know either. And so um, us as asset allocators and financial planners are really looking at trying to balance those positive and negatives um, while really ultimately understanding um, how to manage risk in this time frame and preserve capital. I'll let you um, give the intro peek here into the recent Berkshire meeting. Sure. So um, those of you who tuned in live, you could have done so uh, Saturday. So Warren Buffett, you know, is the CEO of Berkshire Hathaway, and they have a big annual shareholders meeting, which draws thousands and thousands of people to it. So obviously had to cancel the live uh, audience this time. And um, so Yahoo Finance did a, did a uh, screening of that. Um, and so he had some, you know, really great comments as he usually does. And, you know, we were always interested to what he has to say. And um, so, you know, he, he mentions he's learning about this the same way that, that we are and that there's an extraordinarily wide range of possibilities on the health and economy sides and nobody really knows. And so that's a lot of what Luke's talking about today, what we've been talking about, that the range of outcomes are very wide. And I think Warren was just highlighting that. And again, that's what Tim Cook and other CEOs are saying is that we really don't know what the future holds. And so, you know, when you have a lot of business leaders pulling their guidance and saying, I can't see, you know, through the future, um, yeah, it's uncertain times. Right. And so it's not to say that that means that everything's going to go down and everything's going to go really badly. Um, it just says that we don't know that, that, that there, there's a possibility for that. And there's a possibility that things continue higher. So, you know, when we, when we kind of set out about this weeks ago, we were, we were mentioning that, you know, expect a lot of volatility. Volatility just means changes in direction. Right. And so we only, we don't, volatility is only a bad thing for us when it's going down, right? Nobody minds volatility when volatility is going up. And so, but we are seeing that. And um, so we're, as we are getting more information as the markets or as investors or, or wealth managers, you know, we're, we're able to kind of see that direction better and, and make better decisions. So, um, you know, some of the highlights that he has, of course, is that the economic tailwinds that we have are going to persist. Okay, so in the long run, you know, Warren has definitely come out and doubled down on America getting through this again, as, as we knew he would, that stocks are still going to be the best place to put your money in the long term. Um, he's taken advantage personally of the, or his company of the low interest rates and has borrowed very large sums of money at near zero interest rates, which is something that we talk about in personal finance. When we look at, like CEOs look at their business, we look at our financial statements and know that there's just these four variables of assets, liabilities, income, and expenses. We call it alley. And so making decisions on any one of those four variables during good and bad times. And then that's what we can do to, to focus on what we can control. So we've talked about that in prior episodes of taking advantage of low interest rates in bear markets. And, and that's what great business leaders like Warren Buffett do for their companies. Uh, we, we definitely are taking this um, same approach as, as uh, being humble in our forecasting of the future, given that there's such a wide range of potential outcomes and make sure that we're tuning into the ex experts uh, who we quoted with you many, you know, week in, week out, you know, trying to bring those experts to, to our perspective of, you know, so looking at Dr. Anthony Fauci and Bill Gates and, and the like, and, and what they have to say on this global financial crisis. Uh, when, I, when I'm conducting my research on economic indicators or on the market in general, one of the things that I really like to see is market breadth. Uh, when I see the monthly purchasing managers index, I wanna see that seven out of 16 or 10 out of 16 industries or sectors are reporting positive leading indicators. It's not very comforting to see a purchasing man manager's index of 55, which is a diffusion index, which indicates growth, if it's only coming from two different industries. Um, it's, it's a market that's very susceptible um, to failure. And so um, effectively what this is saying is that 
yes, the S&P is, is outperforming Berkshire, but it's doing it because it has a significant weight in tech. And obviously, since we're doing this conversation online, um, because of technology, technology is doing decent right now, if not exceptionally well. Yeah, and you know when you take a look at the you know constituents of the index, you know, and uh, um, you know you, you look at the Nasdaq 100, which we know is tech focused, but you know you still see that you know over 40 percent of the index is allocated to just four names, four companies make up 40 percent of that index, and. And you know those four or five companies make up over twenty percent of the S and P five hundred, right? So, so that's what you're saying. You know, when we look at you know the, this disease and and the current stay at home orders, and we're still we're using more of these technologies and products like offered from companies like you know, those those stocks have continued to perform. Thus, they make up such a big part of the index that the, the index, the, it looks like the stock market is doing very well because of just a few companies. Is that kind of what you're saying here? Very much so, yeah, absolutely. I mean, honestly, it's just math. I've heard you say that before, but the way the index constructed and how it's performing around, it's just math. There's a higher weight in stocks that are doing substantially better. So, I mean, what's the reality for the rest of the companies and you know, the rest of the businesses out there you know, and, and going on today. So we, if we look at the stock market index, it looks like, okay, we're, are we through this almost? Or, I mean, what's the reality of, of what's going on in, in the rest of the areas? Well, I mean, that's a, that's a good lead point into the next slide. We have a slide here that has the S&P 500 PE ratio. Um, and within this slide, effectively what this slide is, is telling you, um, simplistically, is it's telling you that the current, PE multiple for the S&P, the index, or effectively the stock market, is around 20 times. And what you can see from this, this chart here is that that multiple is not at the bottom, it's not at the middle, it's at the top of the historical range, which suggests that you're paying a very peak or high multiple for today's earnings. Um, so let's transition from multiple to earnings. So what kind of earnings am I paying for in the S&P? Well, we just went through a scenario where Tim Cook at Apple and the CEO of Uber and the CEO at 3M um, do not have visibility into Q2 earnings. So I'd say these earnings that I'm paying for uh, are not very visible or of substantial value, yet the market is pricing those currently around 20 times. I would recommend that that's probably more like 24, 25 times, given that the earnings need to come down substantially. So um, market strength right now, the pricing of the market is really being driven by tech stocks that are having a massive, massive tailwind into their businesses. I mean, case in point, as I'm having this conversation, um, the future is not likely to be the same as what we remember it to, the past to be. What I mean by that is that um, as we return, as we come out of a bear market and the economy begins to recover, it's unlikely that it's going to recover in a familiar scenario. My, my daughter just walked through this presentation because they're having ballet across the room. I'm having a meeting right now in my home with ballet and, and, and items that are not normal, not things that I'm used to in my, in my previous career. So as we think about a new normal as the economy begins to um, rebound from this, and we were just talking about price to earnings ratios, the, the, the topic that comes to mind is profits. And I'll use an example about um, restaurant and how profits might be impacted as the economy begins to reopen. So if I'm a restaurant manager and I'm thinking about opening, reopening my business, I'm asking myself, how many people should I staff in my restaurant? What sort of food, food should I buy? I don't know what the demand is going to be. Um, how long do I continue to have a limited staff? How many people am I being allowed to seat at one time? Um, are people interested in coming at five o'clock and then nine o'clock? I mean, these are substantial unknowns and every one of these decisions has an impact on that restaurant's profitability. And I would suggest, I've heard this said before, so I'll copy it, but I would say that if, if we're going to mandate that restaurants can only have 50% capacity for the next 12 months, I would predict that most restaurants will go out of business. And so while that's just one example of a restaurant and may not be uh, a great example of another another type of business, it definitely exemplifies the lack of visibility 
and the challenges that uh, the United States economy is going to have as we try to rebound out of this um, bear market and start having profits and growth again. So it's just- right. and, and, and that challenge is kind of coming back to the light switch where, you know, we can shut down the restaurant and then we can, you know, if we're trying to flip it back on, but it's not the old system. I mean, you know, you were, you were commenting before about how, you know, now you can open the restaurants, but perhaps we're not going to be able to allow to have restrooms or, you know, what are some of the proposed limitations and Right. So Gap Stores announced today they were going to open 800 domestic stores, but they were going to do it without dressing rooms and without restrooms. And um, Gap Stores is already struggling because a lot of their business is moving online. So now we have a business who's having a difficult transition because of online purchases, who's now opening up a brick and mortar store, which costs substantial capital for their business. And yet the value of being at the store, which is trying on clothes, you can't do. Right. I mean, that's why I would go to the store is because, you know, I want to be able to try it on and I'm not sure if I want to buy it online. And then, you know, the malls actually have, have kind of transitioned to having experiences. Right. And so there's been a lot of food and restaurants and and social experiences, of, you know, I think they're called power centers and, uh, you know, lots of kid hangouts and place like that. So, you know, you can't flip that switch back on, even though no. you buy clothes potentially there. Right. And, and, and while we're talking about some of the draconian items that, that we could be seeing uh, in the market as we move forward, um, you know, I'll, I'll take a personal stab right at, right at you, Dustin. Uh, I'll just use uh, Kansas City Chiefs since I'm from Kansas City. If Pat Mahomes throws a touchdown at the side against the 49ers in the Super Bowl, right. <laughs> the um, 49ers defense is going to adjust. They're going to adjust by the second half. And no longer should that opportunity be available. And that analogy is suggests that, that as this virus comes into our country, it comes into our world and our life, we develop muscles and we develop knowledge on how to respond to it. And should we see a resurgence of the disease um, or any changes of pace that, that highlight additional risk, all of us at least have some sort of muscle development that enables us to react. And so while the risks remain and the, the challenge is tough. Um, there is reasons to have optimism and try to balance optimism in the market with what really seems pessimistic. Right. And so as you have a lot of these, you know, um, other businesses that are going to be really challenged. So if I think of the local San Diego restaurant or these other companies again you know I'm, I'm winning in that scenario and you know couldn't that market just continue to drive forward even though there's all these bad headwinds and wouldn't that you know lead that index higher and you know why wouldn't you know that continue in a during this economic bad time it certainly could during the bad time um but let's let's just go ahead and forecast seven years in the future let's forecast a full market cycle um, the change that we've seen of shelter in place, the change that we've learned to work at home and use technology to connect with people, whether it's business or personal, has legitimately accelerated demand for an industry, um, online communications. This, this industry has existed, which is why we've immediately moved. Created connecting customers. But the reality is, is that the demand has moved so fast in these areas that now, there's likely to be 50 successful companies that have one versus 250 companies that were developed exactly for this acceleration demand that we're seeing today. So I think it's, I think it's pretty doubtful that seven years in the future, we're going to have the S&P, what I say before, the S&P 7. Right. Yeah, I, I think it's doubtful that you'll have seven, seven names that are effectively the size of 90% of the economy. I don't think that's right. And I think a healthy market will have breadth in it where industrials can outperform um, financial services can outperform transports, energy. Um, I think that there'll be breadth in the market um, in a healthy bull market. And I think all of these data points just suggest, just remember we're in a bear market and there's reasons to have caution. There's reasons to analyze risks. And I'll just throw a plug in here, but you know, now is a really exceptional time to make sure that your financial plan is sound, that your financial planner understands how to calculate your risks and that you have professional asset allocators to allocate your risk appropriately for your financial plan. Yeah, absolutely. 
Um, I'm just going to give a little reminder to anybody out there who wants to uh, ask a question, propose a question in the Q&A box below. Uh, so if you have any questions about the economy, the stock market, financial planning, what have you, go ahead and enter that in below. Um, before we continue on, I'm going to go ahead and post a poll out there. So we have some uh, questions that we love to get your feedback on. So post it up there. So uh, why, do you, why do you attend the webcast? And uh, we'd like to know, is it here to learn new things about finance investments? Uh, you wanna stay current on what's going on? You're just bored, don't have anything better to do. Uh, also, we want to know of these big three, which are of most concern to you right now, inflation, taxes, or market crashes. And also, if you'd like to share, how are you spending most of your free time these days? Um, reading, watching TV, talking to friends, taking walks and hikes, breaking quarantine rules. So go ahead and be honest. We won't uh, share your results. You can be anonymous and, uh, and, and let us know. So while we have that poll going, I'll keep that open for a little while. So I think that a lot of people are, are still like really a mist of, you know, how do we have just all this death, all this disease, all this unemployment, and there's just seems just this massive disconnect with the real world and Wall Street. I just feel like, you know, you have Main Street and Wall Street, there's always had this gap and, and um, you know, it'll be interesting to see, I think you and I have been theorizing a little bit about, you know, what's gonna come to pass about this. You know, as we play through this scenario and, you know, and, and thinking about how willing the government was at a click of a button to dispense $6 trillion to solve the stock market problems when social problems, you know, have, have been met with a lot of resistance. And, and so, you know, not making a stance here from a political standpoint at all, but just will be interesting to see, you know, if, if anybody's paying attention to that and how that plays out. Um, but I also kind of think it's important to, you know, take all this information that we're talking about today and, and in other episodes. And, you know, the stock market is driven by two primary things, which are first earnings, you know, what are the profits of these companies? And then what is the sentiment of that market? Um, and so the market sentiment is, is really tricky to figure out, but it, it comes back to these three places where all of the information is, and I talk about this all the time as a result to finance and financial planning, but in life in general, information is, is just in these three camps of what we know we know, what we know we don't know, and what we don't know we don't know. And um, I think actually I have a couple slides to kind of share that thought with you. So if we look at all the knowledge that's out there, you know, and all the possible knowledge, we have to just assume that by far and away, most of it is we don't know, we don't know. I mean, there's just more information out there. And, and that's what we're doing as wealth managers and advisors is we're tirelessly looking at this data and trying to figure out, you know, what did we miss? What do we know? And then what, what information is in this camp of, of what we know we don't know? And that really drives a lot of the stock market uh, decisions. And so if you kind of think of it in these different buckets and what, ha what happens if we, these are all full of water, you know, and I'm, I'm kind of taking my ladle and I'm putting, you know, the information that's out there into these differing buckets. And when this bucket is full, what we know we know, um, the stock market really likes that. Um, when there's what we know we don't know, the stock market likes that a lot better than the unknown unknown. And so when there's really a lot of fear that this is in a bucket, but an ocean, right? So kind of what Luke, you were talking about, like, you know, we didn't know what COVID was. We didn't know that there was different strands. We, we didn't know that, you know, really much of anything or how we were going to combat it or how that life was going. And so we just felt this tidal wave of, of things that we had no idea we even needed to research or understand. And all of a sudden, you know, Dr. Fauci has been in this industry and in this, in this place in our, in our uh, country for the same place for like 30 years, all of a sudden he's a household name that everybody knows, you know, of, of how important the work that they've been doing to combat viruses and, and how important that is to our daily life. And, so, 
you know, as the information kind of gets here. And so what we know, we don't know. It's kind of like, I think back to 2018, sneakily, you know, a year and a half ago, the S and P 500 lost, you know, went down by 20%. It went down in a way that a lot of uh, individuals didn't notice because of, I think of when, you know, monthly and quarterly statements go out, but from peak to trough it was down over 19%. And you look back at the economy back then and it was very strong, but you had these, what we don't, what we know, we don't know. And that was what the fed was going to do with interest rates and how the trade war was going to settle out. And if you look at those two events compared to what we're suffering now economically, there's no comparison, right? I mean, there's just no comparison financially doing the math that whatever the worst case scenario of the, of the interest rates and the, um, and the trade war, I mean, I, I would assume there's just no comparison to having 30 million Americans out of work and what that would do to the economy and, and how much uncertainty that is. But that's how the market can react quickly. That sentiment, even though companies are still profitable, they're not pulling their guidance, they're not laying people off. The market can pull back 20% because of the information is in what we know, what we know we don't know. And then what happens is we get the ladle kind of spoons the, the water over to say, okay, the Fed has come out about what they're going to do with interest rates. We have a deal with China. And then in 2019, the markets return, you know, 30% because of that information. So I think as we're going through this, you know, this is really what we're looking at is, you know, is information coming back to back to here as we try to reopen the economy. So one of those things that was a, a known unknown was when is the economy going to reopen? We know that it will. We know it's going to be in phases, but we don't really yet have a, a line drawn in the sand. And so when you start to have some of these things of when are the cases going to flatten out, when is that line going to be drawn in the sand? The market really responds very favorably to that and sentiment can change, even though there hasn't been an underlying fundamental change in profits. So just as the market's going up, when, when we haven't had better guidance on the profits, you know, the market went down in 2018 when companies were still profitable, but it was just where this information lies. I think why it's so uncertain and why Warren Buffett and Tim Cook and all these other CEOs and, and wealth managers like ourselves are saying, look, the range of outcomes is so wide and don't let anybody tell you that they know what's going to happen next because we don't. And we're just trying to work tirelessly to come back to this pool and see how much information is out there that we need to we need to study and understand and know. Um, and as that information flows through to these buckets, we'll be able to make better decisions and have better visibility into the future. And, and yeah, Luke, you're right. You know, we're never going to know what the future is. What did you say about predictions? I'll misquote it. Yeah, so you just say it. I, um, uh, predictions are difficult, especially about the future. <laughs> yeah, right. The whole famous quote that every investor should remember. Yeah, absolutely. So anyway, I just wanted to share that with you because I know it, it, is, it is crazy to see the stock market go up when we have massive deaths, massive disease, massive unemployment, and just staggering bad information and watching that market go up. And, and I've seen it do that both sides, right? So it, we've seen it go up, we've seen it go down when you know it's gone down when there's not enough bad news and it's gone up and there's not enough good news. And, and that's just kind of what we look at in the experience and in investing in the stock market. And the most important thing, I think Luke, what Luke's talking about is working with your advisors to come up with a plan to have these time segmentations and have, you know, a time horizon on what your investment goals are for, for particular parts of your portfolio. That's going to really help you sleep at night, live your life and have a, be a much better investor. So I'm going to uh, share the results from our poll. So we see that, um, most of you tune in because you want to stay current with everything that's going on. So good. I'm glad that we uh, that's good information. We'll make sure to continue to share other information. Um, and 7% of you will lose once the, once the economy reopens. So we'll, we'll be sure to stay in touch though somehow. Um, so, the, so still we're, we're uh, concerned about market crashes. I wasn't sure if this was going to be 100 or not. So 64%. Okay. And some of us are still concerned about inflation and we're always concerned about all three. So, but I, but I see that. So that's a, that's kind of what I figured. Um, 
but only 64% actually on market crashes. So, so that's good. Um, and then how are you spending time during your free days? Okay. Most of you are abiding by the rules. Okay. Taking hikes is uh, the, the lead, talking to friends and family, watching Netflix, reading. Yeah. I, I think I've almost run out of streaming shows to watch. I'm, I'm digging deep, but absolutely. We've enjoyed connecting with our friends and loved ones. I've done a lot more of that. And I live in San Leo Hills. I'm looking out to hiking trails all around me. So um, I, I don't think, I think my dog is the biggest winner in this whole thing. So they're going to be really sad. These, these pets of ours when we return to daily life, I think, and, and go back. So, um, all right. So I'm going to, uh, um, end our prepared presentation there and I'll go and look at, uh, some of the questions that we have. Um, let's see. Yes, next time we will add day drinking to the poll, it looks like, as uh, how you're spending your free time, so careful there. <laughs> but yeah, hopefully this doesn't continue on too, too longer. Um, so let's see, T questions about uh, Fauci commented on, on the inevitability of a second wave in the fall and some suggest it may be worse than we're dealing with now. Any comments? Yeah, I mean, I think that we specifically talked about this a lot last week and throughout the weeks, I've been talking about the coming of the second wave. And that is what we would refer to as, you know, kind of the unknown unknown, where market strategists are gonna say, well, that's speculation. But again, that's where just so much of the data is. And so when we're saying that there's a wide range of outcomes, um, they're saying, yes, that absolutely could be one of the outcomes. And that would not be good for reopening the economy. And that would not be good for many sectors of the stock market. That would not be good for many Americans' lives and our psyches. And that is a potential outcome. And we just don't know. And that is something that we are watching very closely. I think one of the benefits of reopening the economy now, there's some debate of whether we should be doing it or, or what phases or when. But to see the, the responsiveness to being able to flip that light switch on and off and see if we're able to learn social distancing behaviors and learn to reopen businesses and return to the workforce now uh, versus in peak flu season, if we stayed shut in and, and tried to do it uh, during peak flu season. So, you know, I think, again, we get more information like Luke's talking about singing happy birthday, washing your hands and ordering our masks and our protective equipment and all that kind of stuff. So, you know, hopefully as time goes on, you know, we're, we're much better prepared than we are today than we were 45 days ago, should a second wave come. And so how much more prepared are we going to be if that happens in October, November, December? Well, one would likely would assume we're going to be much better prepared for a second wave, you know, six months from now than we are today. So that's the, what I know I don't know, right? And so what we're going to be tracking as far as what we can institute as a society to be able to prepare for that and maybe minimize the economic and social damage that comes through. Um, all right, would you say the market has a more, would you, would you say the market has more chance for an upside or downside for the remainder of the year? You know, I, I think that um, we don't know. I mean, Luke, how would you answer that question? Because I wouldn't. <laughs> and well, that wouldn't be. Um, I, I would say um, I would I would agree. I would say that uh, this this conversation we've had today has been most about visibility. I would say the visibility in upside versus downside right now has a wide range of outcomes. And I would I, it's not the greatest answer, but that's that's the real answer. Um, and and I, what I would prefer to answer is how what do I think it's going to be in three years from now? What do I think it's going to be in four years from now? And I think that we will have strong market growth compounded over three, four, five years. And I'm also very comfortable just looking at investor portfolios that the risk that is allocated to market activity that is in within the stock market is appropriately allocated based off of Alley and all the financial planning done here at Presidio. Yeah, absolutely. And, and I, I would just say that there would never be a year where I would be, feel comfortable answering that question. There would not be a time when we can answer the question. And, and if you do, I don't think you understand how the stock market works and, and how investing works. You know, if we knew that, um, it, 
I, we would cease to have a job if, if, if somebody could accurately predict that. And so, you know, what we look at are t- longer term time horizons where the predictability of the direction of the stock market, at least historically, you know, you can really increase your confidence. But, you know, what one counterpoint to this is it should not matter to anybody on this call whether the stock market finishes higher or lower by the end of the year. That absolutely should not matter one iota in your life at all, affect you in any way financially, whether the stock market is up or down this year. It might make you sad if it's down and make you happy if it's up, but it, it should not have any impact on your financial goals, depending on where the market is on December 31st of 2020. So if, if, um, if you don't know how that it, it could be, make sure that you get a plan where you have that confidence and belief of where your money's invested and, and what your time horizon is on that money. So good question, whoever put that out, thank you. What does all the money printing and current interest rates mean for us five or 10 years from now? Uh, so Luke, what are your thoughts or comments around that? Well, my, the argument that has been floated around recently is that we'll see inflation. Of course, that argument's been around for the better part of a decade. Um, I think we just talked about how the economy is going to rebound, that it's going to be a struggle. And uh, uh, employment numbers came out today with another 20 million jobs that were lost. So while I'm definitely aware of money printing and the concept that more money flowing through and having velocity money creates inflation, currently I'm more concerned about um, job loss and the lack of velocity in spending. So without velocity of money, you're going to have a really hard time creating inflation. And the question specifically, specifically says five, 10 years are now, and I don't have a, a, a telescope that works that far. Uh, I think it's an appropriate time to say it's hard to predict the future in five, 10 years is impossible. Yeah, and I think it's also important to kind of know this, and we've had that question about this printing money, and I get and I get the fear and and kind of what does this all mean? Because it's a lot. I mean, it's a lot, and you know, you just say, well, well, what's going to happen? How do you just create this and borrow all this money? I mean, aren't we going to have to pay that back? I think the first thing to kind of understand is it's never going to get paid back. Like that, that's that's never the plan is to retire the the debt. Um, so, so that's not in the plans. It's never part of the plan. So if you kind of, again, kind of go back to understanding how it is to buy a home and have a mortgage and kind of look at, you know, your loan to value ratios. And, and so sometimes like in a bear market, it could seem like a lot, you know, and, and, you know, if, if you had a house back before the financial crisis and, you know, you were, uh, you bought it in 2006 and, you know, you had a mortgage that at the time was only 60% loan to value. You went off the cliff and the housing values dropped substantially and you owed all this debt that, you know, a beginning didn't seem so bad. And maybe you even had to borrow more because you lost your job and, and maybe you were about a hundred percent levered, you know, maybe you're maybe a million dollar house that had a $600,000 mortgage was all of a sudden worth 600,000. And the debt seemed really really uh, scary at the time. You, know, you fast forward to today and that, that house is worth, you know, a million and a half and the mortgage is 600,000 and um, you, you didn't have to worry about paying it back. So again, I think that so long as there's economic growth in the economy that um, I think where, where, where it would hurt us is if that interest rate um, the cost of the borrowing was eating into the gross domestic product and and eating into the earnings of our country. Um, So the rates are very, very low. Um, So it should spell, and this is what the stock market is also reacting to, one of those uh, known unknowns that became a known known is this government stimulus and that there is lots of money and that should spell well for growth. And as Luke's is saying, yeah, that, that could absolutely lead to inflation Um, and taxation, right? And those are things that we've talked about before. Obviously, these are the big three, and there's just a balancing act between inflation, taxes, market crashes. So that's a good question. Um, Let's see. I think I have gone a little over. Let's see if there's one more. Um, I'll I'll, I'll leave. There's a lot of good questions. I'm just going to pick this last one. Always hear pricing in. So kind of, I think what this is referring to is I always hear about the, this is already priced into the stock market. What do we know what is priced in and what's not priced in? 
you have any, how would you answer that? Well, uh, we don't. It, it takes a lot of, of time and skill set to try to estimate what is priced in or not. And um, I'd say it's, it's definitely a reason to hire a professional for asset allocation. But if we really want to dig into it, I would think about it as um, how are items priced into a car? How are items priced into a house? What sort of features create value in that? And so we think about when we do a broad discussion and try to share different perspectives on the market, we think about what features are in the market and do I think that price is appropriate? So uh, the reality is, is when you ask the question, how do we know it's priced in? You're actually, you have to ask yourself, what do you think is priced in? And um, so we just use our judgment and our you know, decades of experience on how to judge that question. Yeah, and, and again, I think that's a lot of, and why I like that question is that, you know, it's a lot of what we're talking about, of what gets priced in, and it's kind of, it's the flow of information from these three buckets. And so when something goes to being priced into the market, it's like, did an unknown unknown become a known unknown? Or did an unknown known become a known known? And I know that's, it's kind of difficult to follow all of that, but you know, all the information is out there and it's falling into these three categories. So that, that I thought was a good question because it, it's, is, um, you know, kind of directly what we're talking about or indirectly what we're talking about tonight is how do things get priced into the market? And so there's of course corporate earnings. And so how does the market move with confidence when all the companies have pulled their guidance? You know, if companies are saying, I can't tell you what we're going to be like in the future, and then people have to make up their mind about stuff. So they look at the data. And again, they're looking at these three camps. And I think as information moves from one to the other is kind of what gets priced in to the market. So, um, you know, the market is looking at all of that information and, and making decisions, um, which kind of creates their sentiment. And, and the final comment out there is, yes, my smoke detector needs new batteries, but uh, I was here home alone during this, so I, I couldn't leave you tonight to uh, do that. So it was distracting for me more than it is for you, I can, I can assure you. So, so sorry for that. But Luke, I'm so glad you're here on the team. I know that everybody's going to get to know you a lot better. And uh, thanks for joining me uh, tonight. We'll have you back many other times. And uh, everybody else, thank you so much. We'll, uh, we'll keep this going next week, four o'clock for episode nine of the Presidio Perspective. So again, I'm Dustin Tenberg. I was joined by Luke Jacobson here tonight. If you have any questions, want to get in touch with us, make sure you can always give us a call, 858-461-4959, or go to our website, presidiocm.com. You can request an appointment directly online. And we look forward to speaking with you in the future. We wish you well. And absolutely, this is your last chance out there, guys. If you haven't gotten the Mother's Day flowers, you haven't put the card in the mail, you still have time. It's coming up, so make sure you do so. And to all the mothers out there, I wish you and we all wish you a very happy Mother's Day. So thank you guys from Presidio. We'll see you next time. Bye-bye.